meeting will be recorded and will be available on the Highland Council website for about a year. We'll just move into the matters that's on the agenda and apologies. Um, I haven't received uh, any, I think everyone's here apart from Councillor Bremner and Jarvie. Yeah, thank you, Anne. That's fine. I, I haven't had any either, so that, that's fine. And we'll move on to item two now, the declaration of interests. If members ask to consider whether they have any interest to declare in relation to any item on the agenda. Don't see an, anything happening there. No, no, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, recess powers, it's uh, just asked to note that the recess powers granted by the Council uh, did not require to be exercised in relation to the business of the Caithness Committee. The minutes are attached and have been circulated for noting uh, the last committee meeting 29th of May and were approved at the full Council meeting 29th June. Are you happy to, to note that? No, there's no, there's no, uh, yeah. no comments there. Thanks, thank you, thank you, members. Now I'm delighted to say that we have uh, Paddy Farrell here from the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, who's going to go through his um, report. So I'll hand over to you, Paddy. Thank you, Chair, and good morning, members. Uh, I'm Station Commander Paddy Farrell and I'm here to deliver the SFRS performance report for quarter one 2023-24 uh, on behalf of the Highland LSO. Uh, if I could just open by saying uh, Group Commander Jamie Thrower uh, had intended to attend the meeting, however, he's unable to do so due to a uh, bereavement, uh, but he has sent his apologies and is looking forward to attending the next meeting. If I could please direct your attention to section 3.3 of the, the, cover, the cover report. Uh, during the reporting period, we have seen four accidental fires occur in domestic settings. There were no deliberate fires in domestic settings during this reporting period, but five did occur in non-domestic settings. This has been a, these deliberate fires in non-domestic settings have been a combination of grass fires, rubbish fires and benzolite throughout, throughout the area. Six road traffic collisions occurred in the reporting period. This does represent an increase on quarter one for the previous reporting year, but it is still low compared to the area total. 15 UFAS incidents were attended during the reporting period. Following a public consultation, SFRS have introduced uh, its UFAS incident procedure, which has changed our response to automatic fire alarm incidents in non-domestic premises. This does not, this change does not affect uh, sleeping premises such as hospitals, care homes or domestic premises and I should emphasise that SFRS will always attend an incident where a fire is reported. If I could move to section 3.4 of the report. SFRS are continuing with recruitment efforts across Caithness and I would like to take this opportunity to thank the elected members and local employers for their assistance in support in both recruitment and releasing staff members to undertake firefighting duties. While we do welcome applications uh, for stations across the service, in particular support is requested for recruitment in Dunbeath and Leipster. Available, as um, members will be aware from the, from the report, availability at Thurso Fire Station has been affected during the reporting period due to various annual leave and sickness absence. As of Friday, all personnel have now, be, have now completed their core skills BA training and are now able to contribute to crew and levels for appliances. So we expect to see an improvement in the availability figures going forward. Also, one further recruit, new recruit is due to join to begin their initial training next week, which will bring the station establishment to 18. Thurso Fire Station is also set to take delivery of a brand new appliance next month, fully equipped with the latest dedicated rescue equipment. This represents a significant investment by SFRS and will serve to enhance the capability of local crews and response to incidents in the area. Thurso Fire Station also has an open day schedule for Saturday the 9th of September, 
notice will be circulated uh, in due course, but I would like to take this opportunity to share this in invitation with the elected members and ask if you are able to attend. This would be a great opportunity to meet and have a chat in person and also uh, to meet some of the other crew members in the station. Chair, this is my submission to the committee. Uh, I'd be happy to take uh, any questions or any comments on the report. Lovely. Thanks very much, Paddy, for, for your report. And that's, that's good news for Thurshaw, at least. The mm -hmm. New appliance. Come down and have a look at that. And uh, I certainly hope to attend your, your open day. So I'll open up now to members if they've got any questions for, for Paddy. And, um, Wally, you got your hands up there. On you go. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Paddy, for your report. I'm just getting my voice back after a conference this weekend, so sorry about that. <coughs> However, Paddy, great report indeed. Well done, well done. I was concerned about the accidental fires. Uh, it uh, amazes me how, how they, they, they create these fires in a non-domestic setting. But deliberate fire, deliberate fires, you did explain in a, in a non-domestic setting. That's quite worrying, really. But not to worry, uh, Paddy. My question would be, I see you had a uh, successful fire skills programme with young people. So, Paddy, what briefly did that entail? Well, the fire skills programme is, uh, it, it's basically an, a, effectively an engagement tool, uh, which we can use, uh, and it, it it, it's quite it's quite a good tool for us to use because we can basically tailor it for a specific uh, area or how we deliver it can change based on on course uh, and demand. Uh, uh, it, what it, if I take the, the the most recent one that we carried out here at Thurso? It was a it was basically uh, two weeks. Um, over over a two week period, rather at Thurso Fire Station with uh, young people from uh, Thurso High School, uh, and over that course we will cover everything from. We can go cover first aid. We can cover. Uh, I'll, I'll cover a lot of practical fire service stuff as well. Uh, I'll, I'll um, they, they carry out visits to uh, Wick Airport. They'll carry out. They'll do some a lot some community work as well, and it, it will culminate in a pass out display where they basically they cover a lot of firefighting drills uh, th throughout the course, and that will culminate uh, in a, a pass out display where they basically are able to demonstrate their skills, their practical skills, and their knowledge um, for their family and friends. Uh, it, can be the, the demand for that course can, can vary, and how we deliver it can vary. Uh, it also t uh, a lot of the activities that take place in it are also very very similar to what we would also do in our youth volunteer course, uh, which runs uh, generally with the school year uh, from from Wick Fire Station. Uh, so it's it it can be quite a a, a good course in the t in terms of it. It can be taking people out from a setting which maybe they're not used to and exposing them to to new challenges, new skills, new people. Uh, and hopefully, I think generally the feedback that we've had from the young people that have taken part in the course and uh, has been very, very positive and has been very, very worthwhile. Yes, very that's good indeed. And uh, a bit of encouragement for them to join the fire service possibly at a later date. Well, of course, it, 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 certainly uh, we haven't had anybody, uh, that, as far as I'm aware, in, in Thurso that have who are now old enough to join the fire service, but it may well have um, have uh, encouraged that interest or planted that seed, if you like, uh, later on. It can, it can also be a, a means, you know, if necessarily, if they don't ever want to pursue a career with the fire service, even just things like meeting new people, maybe improving their confidence, communication skills or anything like that. Uh, it, it, it's a whole host of benefits, but of course uh, it, it can uh, have a, a benefit of uh, potentially have a plant, like I said, planting that seed and for for joining uh, later on. Right. Thanks, Paddy. Thanks, Chair. Yeah. Just before you come in, Carl, uh, Paddy, as you know, I attended the the last passing out parade oh, for a want of a better word, and it was really good to see the enthusiastic uh, work that your your uh, participants were doing, and they really enjoyed themselves. It was, it was great to see. Right enough. Yeah, it was. Okay, Carl, have you got a point? Yeah. But thanks, Chair, and, and thank you, Paddy. You know. Before asking a question, I think it's appropriate to comment on the initiative with young people. I thought it was absolutely fantastic. Just seeing the, the press and show, social media coverage itself spoke, and it spoke for itself, you know. So, and I think it points you make, it's going to provide a range of benefits and it'll be just will be interesting to see if there are any increases in intake and such like. But I get for a, for a question, Paddy, I'd just be interested to know, because we all know how, how quickly technology develops and, and the many benefit that comes from it but really interested to know 
what uh, what your new fire appliance may enable. You know, what, just what are the differences? And I'm delighted to to learn that we're getting that type of investment in the county. So that's my question for you, Paddy, and good to see you. Thank you, Councillor Rose. Uh, it the appliance itself encompasses quite a quite a number of changes. Obviously, over time, like you said, technology changes and and uh, and their requirements change. The big, if, if a startup is saying this new appliance is coming fully kitted out, so it it's got the new a fully dedicated range of uh, cutting equipment on it, which is actually which is enhanced compared to what we have at the minute, uh, and it, it's. It, 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 if pre what we currently have is hydraulic rescue equipment, whereas the, the this new generation of cutting equipment, if you like, is hydraulic, so it's 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 electrically powered. So uh, it, it, the kit is more modern, uh, it's it's safer, it's more capable, uh, and the appliance itself is is it, it really has um, a number of changes about its layout, which are better in terms of because um, we're better understanding now the issue of contaminants uh, for, for firefighters. So coming away from a fire scene, uh, where we store equipment, uh, 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 how we you know clean equipment, uh, it's, it's safer for firefighters as well. And like I say, it is, it, it's coming fully kitted out with uh, a, a newer range, a better range of, of equipment. Uh, and is, it, it, it's, just more modern, it's just more reflective of, of the job we do now and the job we do um, and we, we, certainly a lot of the lessons that, that we've learned going forward, like I say, with regards contaminants, uh, with kit storage, um, and making sure that when, it, for example, if our firefighters are coming back from from an incident where they store their kit, um, so it, it's it, it probably be better if if I was able to show it to you, I'll probably be able to give you a better demonstration of it. So hopefully we'll we'll be able to have it here by the open day. But if not, like I said, it should hopefully be here by the end of next month. Um, so if if it's not here by the by the open day, uh, be more than happy to arrange a date for the uh, for the members to come down to the station and view it themselves. Uh, it'd, it'd probably be easier for me to show it to you in person. Uh, but it, more modern, more modern kit, uh, better laid out, and it, it certainly is an improvement not only for the community safety but for firefighter safety as well. Excellent, thanks, thanks, Paddy, and uh, we'll we'll take you up on your offer. Certainly will, because <laughs> it. It'd be nice to see you then. You, as a, in, any other members got any questions or points for Paddy at all? Not seeing anything there, Paddy. So everybody seems happy with your report. So thank, thanks very much, and uh, we'll catch up with you soon. Thanks again. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you to you and the and the members. Uh, kind words and your support. Thank you, and hopefully uh, see you on the ninth. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. OK, well, thanks for that. Now we'll move on to item six, the winter service plan. And I see Josie has joined us. Good for you, Josie. It's over to you now. Thanks. Good morning. Let's make sure I'm off mute. Um, so morning, members. Um, thank you for this. So um, before you will have the paper, which is the winter service plan for Caithness. It's been prepared in accordance with the Council's winter service policy that was approved back in 2018 and remains unchanged. Um, the Council policy sets out the roads hierarchy and target times for treating the roads in around Caithness. Um, the hierarchy dictates the order of treatment um, and then this leads on to the target treatment times for each route. So we have primary routes, secondary and others. Primary routes are generally treated by half eight in the morning, secondaries by nine and others are as resources permit. This changes on the weekend, so the primaries are still by half eight, but the secondaries fall into as resources permit. Um, just as that's how it's been set out, so that's what we've got. What I would say is Appendix A at the back of the report shows um, is a map that shows the routes and the hierarchies are colour coordinated. So the, I think the primary is in red, etc. So we can see where they are. Um, this is all relates to roads. There are um, footways are also part of that consideration, and they do have a hierarchy. But it's worth noting that their treatment is as resources permit. So there are no set treatment times for the footpaths um, in that report. Um, referring to the resources that we have, they're the same as last year. They're based out of the two depots, Wick and Thurso, 
the 10 and 11 operatives, all with LGVs um, to deliver that route um, and that one. Um, the other element I would like to highlight in the report is that the council still operates the Winter Resilience um, Scheme, which is available for communities to apply for to enable them to help treat the footpaths in and around their communities. The application does come through the community council, so it needs that level of support. That um, There's a link in the report and it is available on the council website on that one. The <laughs> only other um, item I think I would draw the members' attention to is item 11, where it covers our grip bins and where we provide them but also how we and when we fill them. It is on an ad hoc basis. And um, the reason I highlight is that we have a significant increase in request for grip bins as, as the weather turns. It's usually the first turn of the weather. Our complaints come in, these demands come in, and they peter off as the winter goes out or if we have a, 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 an additional heavy smell of snow. Um, we do review where the grip bins are you know because sometimes we've we've filled them up and they've just sat there and they've never been used so there is a a, a process that we we should be doing and we will be looking at that but it was just to highlight because people assume that they ask for a grip bin and they get them but we do have you know a set of where they should be so that's my report um, largely unchanged, well, completely unchanged from last year because our main policy hasn't changed. There we go. Any questions? Open it up to members now if you want to. Any questions for Josie? <coughs> Wally? Well, let's see if we've got a question for Josie. Yes, Josie, absolutely impressed with your report again. Excuse me. <coughs> yes, I'm always impressed with your plans for the winter resilience. <clears throat> and the approach you have to the changing weather conditions. Absolutely fantastic. I think you've got every eventuality covered. And um, as you said, what I do like, Josie, is your encouragement to get local people and self-help with the winter resilience. Good. Your primary routes, of course, we all know them very well. Now, uh, Josie, here's a wee question for you. The only criticism we got last year, uh, social media, of course, was this bear's great effort to blacken the A9 for six miles on the top of the Cassiemeyer to Thurshall. And why couldn't we, Highland Council, block our roads such as the six mile stretch from the top of the Cassiemeyer to Thurshall? Now, so Josie, the quick question is, was there a difference in the salt used by Bayer or the salt grit used by Bayer? Or was it the case that they were able to cover that area more often than ours when we were doing our primary routes? There we are, Josie. What do you think of that? <laughs> Firstly, what I would say is the Highland Council operate a service from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. as part of the policy. So we're not a 24 hour service. And that's one of the big differences between us and Bear. Bear do operate 24 hours. That's part of their contract with Transport Scotland. So that's the biggest and first fundamental difference. Um, now, officially, I'm not sure of the state, but having had conversations with Bear officers, my understanding is that they um, they were treating their roads with a different level of salt. We have it set down. We we work to national guidance of what the poly, you know of what the spread rates are per the temperature of salt. And Bear were my understanding is because it was a new contract, um, the fifth generation contract. They had certain terms and conditions that were imposed upon them by Transport Scotland. Now I I. Don't know what they are, but I believe they were different to what our um, policy and our spread rate of salt is. So I suspect, although I can't say for definite, that they were maybe putting out a higher amount of salt because of what they were bound by their contract than what we were doing. But also I know that they do treat 24 hours. So there is quite a significant. And also the amount of traffic that is on the, the main road has an impact on how effective salt is. So. Is it because there's lorries coming from Scrabster going down the A9 and they've got that that traffic working the salt in is having that better impact on it? That is a bearing that could possibly have. That's not one that I could measure for you. But those are the fundamental differences um, between our service and the trunk road service. 
Very good, Josie. Thank you very much. And I can assure you on every occasion I countered any criticism I got about our roads during last winter. So, yeah, well done. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Willie. Uh, any other members got anything to want to ask Josie regarding the winter service plan? No? We've seen any other thing going up. Yeah. I have to say, Julia, I, th I think it's great when we're including the members of the public to do their wee bit. I, I know in Thurso there's quite a, quite a number of, of volunteers out and about and quite keen to get the grip bins filled up again. <laughs> so so it's good. Yeah. Oh, Jan, you want to come in there? Yeah, thanks, Josie. Um, yeah, I think you, you do do an amazing job over the winter trying to keep the roads done and the grip boxes. I know I've asked for a couple for people and they've got them at sort of sensitive hill bits and I know outside my bit I've got one and they're one just further down the hill as well and I know I go and grip for my bit down to the other gritting when it's bad um, because, well, we have some elderly people up here and I'm not including myself in that but I do go and do my bit. Well, can I always give you a high... Everybody did a wee bit, it would help. Yeah, well, we can always provide you with a high-vis jacket to make that bit safer. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, yes. Josie. And, okay. and thanks for all the work you're doing in the roads. It's, it's really impressive. It really is impressive. Thank you. Less complaints for everybody anyway, which is good. <laughs> OK, um, any other members? Um, anything for... We'll see any hands going up. So, uh, OK, thanks. Thanks very much, Josie. Um, I'd just like to ask your members if they uh, invite you to approve the winter service plan. Yep. Yeah. Right. Agreed. Yep. Excellent. I think everybody seems to be. Nobody's saying they're not approving it, so that's a good sign. Yep, that's that's great. Right, Josie, thanks very much and uh, we'll be in touch. Yeah, George, thank you. OK, members, and um, we're getting through the agenda here. Um, move on to item seven, the common good, social common good register. I'm delighted to see Sarah's here to talk us through it. So I'll just hand over to you, Sarah. Thank you. Good morning, members. Thank you very much. Um, yes, we finally got here on Thursday Common Good. Um, you have before you, members, this morning the report on the outcome of the consultation that we ran on the list of property that we're proposing to include as part of the Common Good for Thurso. Um, we've obviously had the, the brief chance of reading through it or running through the type of properties in the background and so forth um, at a ward business meeting, just so that you're familiar with what we were putting forward to you. Um, but that report contains um, details of what the register will look like, um, what the property is um, and the nature and the background of the consultation. Obviously, the important thing to remember is once we set up a register, it's not closed, it's not finalised. Um, there may still be property, as we're discovering actually in some of the established areas, there may still be property that in due course might be assessed as common good. The property, the register um, can evolve as time evolves. What's important is that we've gone through the process and it's been a thorough process that the advantage of starting almost from scratch is that we tackled every bit of open space we could imagine and that the council might have an interest in and tried to see how the council had that interest and whether in fact um, it could be classified as common good or not. So it, it has had a thorough investigation, but that doesn't mean there won't be something else that might pop up in due course. Um, so the position as it stands, as far as the report is concerned, is that the Asset register has been drawn as it will go forward. It needs to be published on the council website, which I will move to do if members are happy with that as a proposal. Um, and then it will really be a case of looking at um, developing strategies um, for the operation of the common good as a fund um, and for looking at how we um, develop and generate income that can be used as part and parcel um, of the requirements of the common good fund. Um, but that will be something moving forward that I'm sure is going to occupy you members um, over a number of meetings uh, and I'll happily assist with that when I can. So it's a fairly detailed report um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Yes. Um, I'll open up to the members now. Anybody got any questions for Sarah? Ah, Matthew? Yeah, um, 
Morning, Ron. Morning, Sarah. I'm just sticking my camera on hope I don't lose the signal, so at least you can vaguely see me, I hope, while I'm talking. Um, Sarah, this is on a sort of slightly more involved question I like to ask, it's because it is complicated, but before I ask the question, it's brilliant work that the officers have been doing, so um, huge thank, and I think back a number of years ago um, when we're in a very different situation and um, we were rec receiving assurances there wasn't um, common good property, so it's great how it's changed. Brilliant. Um, I want to draw your attention to sections, and it is a bit complicated, but um, 3.1 under the implications, 3.5 the risk, and following up that 5.2. And what I'd like to understand a bit better is um, where do we stand as local members in terms of the financial running of the register of the fund? Um, under the there seems to be an on section 5.2 it says there seems to be quote an understanding um that fund will maintain its property assets and it goes on to talk a bit about how the council as in highland council for a while will kind of assist and help us until we get this up and running but what i'd like to understand you know and, and we need to understand this very plainly um in terms of the risk do we have any serious financial risk um, in taking this on. I mean, we really want to, and we want it to make a profit for obvious reasons. But I'm thinking about some of the buildings that are on the register, and we know for an absolute fact that they will cost to maintain. So if you wouldn't mind with the chair's consent, just to, if you wouldn't mind going into a little bit more detail about that side of it. But having sort of sounded a slight cautionary note, I want to emphasize um, you know, strongly in favour of this, but we must be sure about the financial footing. Thank you. Yes, certainly. And this is one of the um, difficulties that we're facing with re-establishing the common goods. And, and obviously, WIC has gone, <coughs> excuse me, gone before in respect of this and is, is, is a few stages ahead. Um, and we also have a similar situation with the Badenoch and Strathspey funds, although they were old established funds that were classed as part of um, already having um, some form of property. At the point that we reinvestigated them, they didn't consider they had physical property. It was only a tiny, tiny amount of money in a bank account. Um, we've now found physical property. So there are a number of funds that now across Highland have, if you like, property assets and no cash assets. Um, there is no statutory responsibility or no statutory situation that says common good funds have to pay for their own um, liabilities. And practice varies incredibly across Scotland. Um, it's, it's one of those areas that is a real grey area. Highland in general, with the historically established funds, have had in place as part of their policy that it's desirable and in most cases it does happen um, that the funds generate their income and bear their responsibilities and liabilities out of the income generated in most cases. Um, the difficulty that we have is obviously in the case of Badnock and Straths Bay, in the case of Wick, in the case of Thurzo and in the short future in the case of Fort William. These are funds that haven't really got or haven't had historically the pot of money. So they're sort of suddenly acquiring um, landed assets, property assets without a ready pot of money. Um, and a balance has to be arrived at. And I think it would be fair to say that we're still in the course of establishing what that balance will be. Um, the council from the point of view of, of general fund responsibilities, and we mustn't forget that all of this is council property. The council was vested common good property exactly the same as every other property. It's just that it has to be managed differently, a bit like mm -hmm. housing revenue property has to be managed differently. It's held on a different account. Um, but uh, there are financial straits on the council the same way as there's financial straits on a lot of the services and the council wouldn't be able to pay for everything that, that all the liabilities that the, com the newly established common good fund has. So one of the first stages will be to go through and we've recently done this on WIC we were a bit delayed doing it on WIC probably because of the the elections the new council coming in but 
in early course, it would be a good idea to do this in respect of Thursday is to go through all the assets, look at the income generation potential, look at what could already be bringing in income to the common good, because there are some assets that will bring in income to the common good. Look at assessing what the liabilities of all the buildings will be. I mean, that's not an easy task to do that, but it, it needs to be done. Um, and then looking at how we balance a situation whereby Thurso Common Good can take responsibility, certainly for some of its liabilities, whilst also hopefully accruing a pot of money, because we have to look at the future proofing of the fund as well. And we have to look at what these assets and these buildings may need in the future. Um, and we don't want to stack up problems for ourselves in the future if we're not able to keep them maintained, for instance, now. But it will be a very fine line. And I think discussions will have to continue into the future. Um, to look at how best we do balance that um, regarding council general fund responsibilities and common good responsibilities. Ultimately, the common good can't run at a, it can't operate at a loss. Um, so that really has to we have that uh, forces the point to make us make these decisions and make these discussions and see where we're at, because you can't have a fund that that incurs more expenditure than it has in the way of income. I mean, we just can't be in that situation. Um, so it's not straightforward. I wish I could say straight away, this is what's going to happen, but it will be a very fine balance and there will need to be some um, moving forward discussions and strategies set. Um, whether we do that on the basis of a formal five-year plan strategy or whether we do it initially on a more shorter term basis or whether we do a mixture of both will be how the plan works out and obviously yourselves members as, as being the local members for this this fund are going to be quite crucial in being involved in that in the discussions moving forward okay yeah um thank you sarah so just to, yeah i understand what basically you're saying we need there needs to be quite a lot of thought and mm -hmm. care given into this just quickly one example as you know the borough chambers um which my understanding is they were or probably still are on a list for it's proposed to be disposed of them. And I particularly remember the value that I think was assigned to them, which was I was amazed how low it was. And yet only three weeks ago, there was scaffolding up around that building, you know, carrying out essential repairs, which the council moved extremely quickly to do, by the way. So that's, I suppose, what's um, powering my question. Um, you know, I presume because it's going to move over to our responsibility it, it's no longer up for sale unless we decided that was in the benefit of the of the new fund and my final detail question is thinking particularly of that building and what was the town hall now the north coast visitor center for example are we able to will we be able to instruct detailed <clears throat> surveyors reports structural survey type reports so that we can then be informed as to what the long-term future of these very important buildings are, frankly, for the benefit of the town. So, sorry, I know it's a second question, Chair, but it, um, and I'm extremely reassured to see Struan's got his hand up because he he does have a business head on, which I don't. So my questions are slightly amateurish, but that, that's, if you wouldn't mind, Sarah, briefly answering that, yeah. and then I'll finish. Yeah, I, I'm aware they considered the sale of um, bur the borough chambers, and at the time that they were considering that, there was somebody um, who was heading up that particular department with the council who'd worked in another part of Scotland and was very much aware of common good. So as soon as she um, saw the name Borough Chambers, she got in touch with us quite quickly and said, can you let me know whether or not this is going to be included in Thurso Common Good? So they were aware quite um, soon in that process that it was going to be considered a common good asset. Um, we also take the view um, that we don't do any back accounting because that way basically madness lies, um, both for myself, for yourselves as members and definitely for the finance team. So if the council has now done a significant amount of improvements before we publish the register, then, you know, we wouldn't be getting involved in saying, well, actually, we owe them for that because, you know, it has been known that this is going to be considered as common good. If we want to sell or dispose of any common good asset, we would have to run a consultation. It, it's a process. Uh, we'd have to run a consultation. We'd have to be able to say why we want to do what we want to do. Um, and it would, in all likelihood, have to go to court as well. I think there's, there's no doubt about that. It would have to go to court because of the public nature of the use of the building. Um, the, the town hall's an interesting one because it's only partially common good. Um, the part that is 
um, and this isn't surprising, we do have property across the Highlands that part is common good and part is general fund. Um, quite often it's like playing fields where part of it was gifted and the other part was acquired for a housing title. So they're held very differently. This is the same sort of thing. Um, the part that was the former library was held as for education purposes being a library and actually falls under council responsibility. The rest of it, which was the former town hall, um, is common good and, and it's it's got a nice title that you know we can say is common good. The fact that they've knocked down adjoining walls and it's all one building now is is immaterial. If there's any rent to be paid, it gets apportioned between the two. Okay. So um the finance team are well used to that sort of thing. But yes, it's things like that. It's it's all the the little quirks that common good brings to any sort of area property portfolio that um Thurzo may have um that will need to be worked out. Um, but yes, we don't take, we never have taken the view. What we've we've done is we've sort of drawn a line. Publication of the register um, really draws the line that says from that day onwards, this is what we're formally saying is common good. Um, and it's okay. the only Thank way you. we could do it. Otherwise, you you just would you just couldn't do anything other than that. Yeah. And and would these the surveys I was asking about, would they be part of the information we could receive when we're trying to weigh up what's for the best? I think when you look at what's um, trying to have the certainly the initial strategy meeting, I think what you need to do is look at each asset in turn um, and decide what information you need about that asset. Um, okay. And, you know, very much um, Mac had done a, a, an exercise for WIC where he was finding out exactly what and, and the WIC members and, and yourselves, if you're still there, will see he's found out exactly what the um, financial implications are, for instance, of the town hall there, he managed to get a full breakdown of everything. Uh, I mean, it's not a straightforward and it's not an easy task, but with a little bit of tenacity, you get the information when you find the right person to speak to. So okay. you need all that information. And and this is how it will evolve over, you know, the next sort of few months and things like that. And as as you start taking hold of the reins of Thurzo Common Good, these are the sort right. of things that you'll start to collate the information on. Thank you very much, Sarah. We have tenacity. Thank you. <laughs> thanks. Um, Struan? Uh, thanks, uh, Chair, and, and thanks, Sarah, for the um, for the report and your you know pretty periodical updates that we've had to, to members that have kind of, you know, none of this is blindsiding us. We've been well informed, you know, throughout the process, and I, and I really appreciate that approach being taken because, as uh, I think Matthew said, you know, going back a term and a bit ago, I, you know, we were we were having questions from constituents asking, or absolutely adamant that there would be common good, and we were getting mood music that was coming back saying no, that's that's not the case. So I think it's fantastic that we're in a position where we're 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 able to kind of publish the register. I think there probably will be my gut feeling is there probably will be art and artifacts or etc. That's on there. I think the, the the civic stuff at the North Coast Visitor Centre for one has some quite interesting inscriptions and a lot of the back of it that, that would indicate but you know that's that's for another time and as you said it's it's not something that's a closed book um exercise once once we get to the point that we've kind of published that list i think the the one area i'm, I'm quite interested is is kind of comparing uh Thurzo and, and indeed WIC against some of the other um uh, common good funds that are out there and the type of reporting that we can expect i'm conscious that that's now Effectively, once the register is published, this will now be a, essentially a standing item that comes forward to um, Caithness Committee. Um, and is there any particular common good reports that are, are maybe worth members looking at to say, well, this is the type of information that you could expect for the next few while? Because I'm conscious reading Inverness common good reports is, is, is not much use to ourselves because it's a fundamentally different beast. Um, and I know you've mentioned a couple of others there, uh, for example, I think Granton, Strathspey, I think you're mentioning. Um, and indeed, I think we've learned quite a lot from our colleagues in WIC as they've gone, I suppose, from a member perspective so that we can get the most value out of this. And indeed, that we can then relay that back on to constituents and indeed, you know, interested parties like the Community Council. Is there any particular reports that you think would be kind of a, a good barometer of what we could expect going forward? Um, all the area, all the, the the local areas with common good funds all get their financial monitoring reporting. I mean, you're quite right. Um, Inverness is a totally different uh, kettle of fish and it's the only um, fund that has um, a subcommittee specifically for common good. But then it has significantly more members um, and it has 
a mass portfolio of property. So to take Inverness aside, almost any of the funds, I'm thinking the next largest is Nairn, you've got the Tain, the Dornoch ones, they are all, all the, you've got the Black Isle ones, all of them are all on a similar format of reporting and obviously they vary quite um, considerably in size. Um, so I suppose as a starting point, maybe look at the amount of assets and the type of assets that's, that's included in your register. All of the registers are published online. You can get a feel for what some of the other funds have um, and see if there's there's any specific fund that's, that's similar. I'm trying to think really. I suppose Nairn has um, land and property. Um, they have a number of income generation assets. Um, you know, that. That, that's probably the way to go, really. Um, but yes, I mean, very much with WIC being just that much ahead, but not massively ahead. OK, they've been published for a while, but then we had the short hiatus. Well, we established the new council, um, but they're in almost a directly comparable situation to yourselves um, and starting from scratch. They're the first one really that is properly starting from scratch. I mean, the, the Badenoch and Straths Bay ones have had periodical financial reports over the, the history of the funds, the, the modern council history of the funds, um, but on a regular basis. And possibly what might happen is, you know, moving forward, this would be a standing item on um, area business meeting agenda for discussion, but you may not have a regular financial monitor report until there's definitely something to present to, to committee so you whereas the other ones have them every quarter you might only have them twice a year you know the, the one halfway through and one at the end of the year or something like that but um, you know I think definitely to keep the ball rolling and keep the momentum and to try and get the strategy built as soon as we can then I think there's some benefit definitely in having it as a standing item um, for just discussion and then you can raise anything specific that you want to take forward as an action point for officers to work on. Thank you very much I really really appreciate that and uh, look forward to the to the kind of continuing dialogue as we kind of feel our way through this as uh, as uh, as new members to actually having something that we can call common good. So thank you very much, Sarah. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, thanks, Drew. Yes, yeah, Sarah, it's obviously going to be an ongoing thing and uh, we're really looking forward to that. Uh, see, Helen, you got your hand up. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to emphasise the, the fact that every common good is very different and, and they can progress um, and you get good news and you get bad news. I mean, I, I'm a lead officer for both Invergordon and the Tain common goods. Um, now, in its time, Tain got a lot of money from selling the mussels because it, the, the common good included mussel fishing rights. Um, but obviously we need we needed to use officer expertise for that. I am not a mussel expert. Um, so, for example, recently we had an officer come along to talk to the ward business meeting just to, to look at um, the, the, the way natural grown mussels um, are used elsewhere because it's very different from rope grown and we can't do rope grown because it's tidal. So lots of detailed information so that members could understand um, why we weren't continuing to do surveys to look at, at, at whether or not we could get income from mussels. Um, and that obviously wasn't for a decision. So it was it was a much better taken to the ward business meeting because it was simply a case of understanding something which most of us are not expert on. Um, but obviously the regular reports that come with income can also pick up specific decisions that might need to be made. Um, and, and we, we've, we've certainly done consultations in Invergordon in terms of, of disposal and um, the community very much against it. And then later, when they'd had an opportunity to try something, very supportive of it. So I think it is a real balance. And the, obviously, the governance very much sits with either area committee or if there's a disposal, obviously, more than 10 percent, of course, it's Highland Council. But the Wood Business Meeting is really important because every common good is a bit different because it's even if it's all buildings and land, the balance is always different. Um, so, I, yeah, I think that understanding and that, that depth of discussion is probably where the ward business meeting comes into its own. OK, Helen, thanks very much for that. Um, any other members got any questions? I'm not seeing hands up. OK, Sarah, well, thanks again for that, that really good report. There's a lot of work going into that and it's uh, really reassuring and we're looking forward to the next meeting. Members, we've got a couple of things to, to do. Uh, as on the paper there, uh, 
Note the contents of the asset register in the format for publication. Okay. Yep, I think it agreed. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Note the content of the document title: Social Common Good Property Consultation Representatives and Responses. Yep. I agree to the publication of the Common Good Asset Register for Social. Nobody's saying otherwise. Yeah. I agree to the reclassification of the property included in the register and to the creation of a common good fund for social. Yep, yep. Note that the common good property will continue to be maintained by Highland Council until such times as an income source is established to sustain social common good assets. OK, and note that the creation of a social common good fund and its financial position will be reported to the next meeting of the Highland Council under the minutes of the meeting of this meeting, given that all Highland councillors are custodians of the common good funds across the Highlands. OK, everybody happy with that? That's fine. We've all uh, noted and agreed that thing. So thanks again, Sarah. Thanks very much. And uh, we'll be meeting with you again quite soon, I'm sure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Right, members, on to another common good fund, the WIC one, which is a wee bit ahead of us <laughs> in Thurso, but never mind. Um, quarterly monitoring report. Would it be uh, Raymond? Do you want to come in there? Sorry. No, I'll, uh, I'm happy to wait until if there's any overview from the officer. OK, thanks. Um, the Graham, Graham, are you? Is Graham there? Is it Graham that's going through it, the report? Um, th or Helen? Myself. Oh, sorry, uh, Helen. Sorry, yeah, Helen. No, yeah. no, you're fine. Fine. Yeah. Um, I mean, basically, this does follow on quite well, I think, from from the report that Sarah was just outlining, because it is a step ahead, as as, as you've just said. Um, so this is the kind of format of the standard monitoring report that, that those of us who've got established funds do take. Um, and, and in that sense, it's it's very much like the others. But obviously, at the moment, things are still changing quite a bit. And the things I wanted to to, to pick out on this are obviously that um, although the income is very much on target um, as expected and set out in the budget in terms of expenditure with the utility costs for the town hall now identified, um, there will be additional costs and, and, and members are being asked in the report to to set a, a property budget of 20,000. Now that obviously will result in um, a, a deficit, which will reduce the the usable reserves at the end of the year. But there are still reserves, so it's still sort of financially appropriate for that to happen. Um, and the 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 um, the next action that members are asked is to note that a strategy for the fund will be prepared, and that really picks up on everything that Sarah was saying about the Thursday one. But as you say, this is a little bit ahead, and we're 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 at the time now to begin to to scope that strategy out and that would also come back to a meeting of the committee. Um, so that's really all I wanted to pick out. But obviously, if members got questions, um, Azara and I between us will do our best to answer them. Thanks, Helen. Raymond? Yeah, um, just to um, acknowledge, we've been here um, uh, with a lot of the questions that members in Thurso are uh, asking. Um, we've already been there with the WIC one. Um, this has been quite a while um, in the making, and we know the background of it. Um, we also know the where the liabilities lie. The liability lies with Highland Council, and uh, not necessarily with the um, the Common Good Fund, because before there was a Common Good Fund, Highland Council was having to pay for anything and everything that um, that the, that was relative to the assets of the Common Good Funds, which weren't established at that time. That remains the case. So it's not as if we're talking about a bust fund here. And it's clearly laid out in the report that that's the case. Um, what we're uh, doing is this is the this is the fluid part of it that we've now reached with WIC, where we where we're establishing what are the liabilities, but also um, what I think needs to be uh, drawn out is what are the opportunities with the Common Good Fund, because right now, um, uh, and I've I've had discussion with um, Sarah about this, and um, and and. And that's with a view to moving this forward as quickly as we possibly can to see what we can do about milking the assets. Now, there's a, a, a fair bit going on uh, behind the scenes uh, there, but it's important that that's in the public domain. And what I've said is that we should be having a, a we should get together as quickly as possible um, and to have 
um, more um, discussion about what um, Sarah was mentioning in the previous item, which is to do with um, understanding what is the strategy going forward um, and what period of time is that strategy for? Because it may be that we're looking at a shorter term strategy with a kind of longer term um, view bolted on um, so that we can understand some of the points uh, that are in the, the report that we have here where we know that we are maximising the income from the Riverside um, the Riverside uh, car park, where we know that we are maximising the income from all the opportunities that we have to rent out space in the in the town hall. Right now, that's not the case, but that doesn't mean to say that we can't do something about that as quickly as possible. That can be either, I've, I've, I've already suggested that that should be a, a separate um, ward business meeting for um, ward three members, where we can sit down and actually look at how do we how do we do that? What uh, resources is there to be able to do that? What do we what would we like uh, in terms of opportunity for say the community council if it's minded to um, have a discussion within their own members and then submit um, um, some some considerations uh, to us so that it's an open and transparent process. But within the law. Um, the, the, um, as the, the, the officers of council have clearly stated how we take this forward and who gets involved and who has a say and who uh, has the ability to be able to determine an outcome and who doesn't, even though they have the ability to be able to submit some suggestions. And we need to stick to that. So um, that's where I th I, I, I'm, I'm happy to move the recommendations and the report, uh, knowing that we're at that uh, stage. But in particular, uh, I would like to highlight the uh, the points that were made in, I think it's 4.8 and 4.9. Um, those are the, the important points of this, uh, this report. And I would hope that at some point very, very soon, uh, we can get to what is an overall strategy for the future of WIC Common Good Fund. Um, and that, that will be developed with a focus on income generation and sustainability. And we should be doing that as quickly as we possibly can and I look forward to those discussions taking uh, uh, taking place um, as outlined already by Sarah and uh, Helen Rose. Thanks very much. OK, thanks. Thanks for that. Yes, very important points there. Yes. Has anybody else got any uh, questions for Helen? Jan? Well, it's not a question for Helen. It's just oh. I entirely, I entirely agree with what Raymond's saying. I mean, we need to make it all very clear, and uh, the strategy will help with that, and be open and transparent about the Common Good Fund, because um, some people think we're like the secret squirrels, you know. Um, but <laughs> uh, but I think we need to be open and very transparent. And as you say, if if the community councils want to come with suggestions to us, by mean all means, we are open to it. And as you said, this is all recorded, so they can actually hear exactly what we're saying. But um, I'm I'm happy to second all this, and hopefully, Raymond, um, we could maybe have a a, a meeting pretty soon with Willie and and Andrew if he, if he wishes. Okay, Jan, thanks. Thanks Thank very you. much. Oh, thanks for that. I'll um, I'll leave that for yourselves in Ward Three to to arrange. Yeah. Okay. Is there any other points or questions for Helen on that? I'm not seeing anything. Right, committee members, we have um, a couple of things to do. To note the position of the Wet Common Good Fund at the end of first quarter, twenty three twenty four. Okay. Chair, I've moved the recommendations. Yep, agreed. Okay. Oh, you've, yes, you've you've done them all. Yeah. Okay. Is that everybody happy then with that? Yep. Excellent. Well, thanks again, Sarah. Uh, sorry, Helen. <laughs> Your Sarah is still there. Yes, Helen. Thanks very much. Uh, we move on to item nine. Is that um, Helen again, or is it? I think Fiona Cameron. Fiona's, please call, join Fiona's the come in there. Yes. Lead on this one. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks very much for that. Okay, Fiona, where, where are you? Oh, you're there. Yes. The screen's thanks, jumping you. about here, but I found you, Fiona. Thanks. Thanks very much. Right. OK, Fiona, it's all yours now. Great, thank you and good morning, uh, members. Uh, we're um, bringing an application to you for consideration today as part of the Community Regeneration Fund programme for this year. 
which members will be aware comprises a number of different funding streams, which we use the umbrella term community regeneration funding to describe, to keep it a nice uh, streamlined process for applicants. So uh, this year, the allocations that are available in Caithness are £355,351 for Highland Coastal Communities Fund and £107,660 from the Place-Based Investment Programme. And we're also due to have another small amount to add to this from the UK Share Prosperity Fund, but we're just working on confirming the allocations across Highland for that. So in total, members have available this year £463,011 for distribution. And as members will be aware, we're due to open the funds next week for an open call for expressions of interest. But it was agreed that time critical applications could come to committee ahead of this. So today we've brought the Wick Development Trust application to you for a new facilities building on the campsite in Wick. It's an application for £90,000 with a total project cost of just, a, just over £450,000. Mm. We've undertaken a technical assessment of the project and my colleague Mark is here. Um, if any councillors have specific queries on the project, the technical assessment didn't throw up any concerns. It's a, a well-developed project and we've got a couple of ambers in there um, down to, to time critical things that still need to be met but certainly no concerns raised as a result of that and the project is eligible. So I won't go into any more detail just now but as I say Mark and I are both uh, happy to answer questions that members might have and this is a, a request for approval of this application. Okay Fiona thanks very much for that. Um, I'll open up Raymond yes. Yeah I think that um, Again, I'm going to say a, a, a number of comments here that are um, reflective of comments I've made in previous applications that show similar um, uh, robust and astute um, recognition of what the requirement of the project is uh, in terms of what it needs to do to be able to qualify the funding. That's that's the first. Um, and this application to me uh, does that. Um, I know that um, many, many members um, around the table are very supportive of um, the work of the WIC uh, Development Trust, but that doesn't mean to say that we should not be looking at this in, uh, um, in, with, a critical, um, with a critical view because of the fact that, we have, that we're duty bound to do that. The, um, for me, <clears throat> uh, the, for me, the, the, the bigger picture here is the benefit that uh, this is going to bring to the town, not just the benefit that it's going to bring uh, to the town and its visitors um, and the improved asset, um, the greatly improved asset that this is going to provide for, but also in terms of what this actually can provide for the uh, for a sustained, uh, bigger um, financial investment uh, opportunity for the town itself. This goes beyond the this goes beyond the uh, application that we've got in front of us. This goes beyond um, the um, the the development of the asset that is the the campsite. This uh, goes to what we what we know is going to land up being um, a, a, an opportunity to raise funds, a lot of funds uh, that will then be ploughed into the investment uh, of our actual town centre. Um, and I think that that, for me, is the key here. Um, and how long would it take for us to understand what would we get back um, from this project in terms of the um, the, the ninety thousand that we're being asked here uh, here just now? I think that's clearly laid out in the in the report. I also think that the um, that the um, the rag rating is fair. I think that the rag rating is also um, the comments are achievable. Um, I and I think that that gives uh, the 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 general public uh, what they need and what members need to be able to satisfy themselves that this will be a well invested ninety thousand. So on that basis, I'm also happy to um, recommend that we go with the uh, sorry that we agree to the recommendations here, and uh, I'll leave that um, for other office, uh, for other members to consider whether they would like to support that or not. Okay. Thanks, Raymond. As any uh, Jan. Thanks. Yeah, I'm very happy to support this uh, development as well. Um, I think the asset and the future for the town is absolutely going to be well well outstanding and um, the opportunities that are bring to regenerate the town and you've even just seen it in 
recently all the visitors to the town and different things in the comments about the campsite, how well run it is, how professional it is, etc. The only criticism is what they want to replace. That is the only criticism in what they want to replace. So it really is going to ha enhance the site. Um, yeah, and I'm happy to um, improve approve this 90,000 grant because I think it will benefit the town in the future. Okay, Jan. Raymond, do you want to come back here? Yeah, just very, very, very briefly, and thanks very much for allowing me back in, because I did mean to say that we are already seeing um, similar where we have uh, agreed to the investment of um, public facilities in the town uh, through these uh, funds, Fiona will recall, um, with the Whitechapel Road um, and toilets, and now look at the work that's going ahead there, and they're scheduled for reopening um, at the end of September, beginning of October. Um, if this was when you see physical regeneration like that as an outcome from uh, investment monies like what we are looking at, it gives you uh, confidence in, in, in knowing that maybe this is money that uh, that will be well spent. Okay, okay thanks. Thanks, Rim. Thank you. Uh, come, Carl. Carl, you want to come in? Thanks, Chair. I think it's it's important for uh understand that the applications and, and relates to ward three but i think as ward two members it's it's quite appropriate to comment you know our what we offer as a county awesome. is very is is very important um I, I, and having read the document i think uh, it speaks for itself so just uh congratulate the reward for a uh, work development trust and let's hope that we can build on it as as a county so that's my only yep. comment thank you yeah, thanks, Carl. Yes, yeah, yeah, quite right. Yeah, yeah. Has anybody else got any comments? Not seeing anything else. No. Um, I'm quite happy to approve. Is ever is, is all uh, members quite happy to approve this application? Agreed. Approved. Yep. Right, that's that's perfect. Perfect. Uh, and there's another one we have to agree whether the application should receive a funding award from CRF. Are we happy to agree that as well? Yeah, I've already moved the recommendations. I believe that Councillor McEwen has uh, uh, has seconded. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Lovely. Thanks very much, members. So Fiona and, and Mark, you got away there quite quite lightly. <laughs> I know. I didn't even have to speak. Yeah. <laughs> thanks very much. Cheers. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Thanks Thank again. You. And uh, see you again. Right. Uh, Item 10, the um, award discretionary awards. The committee is asked to note the awards there. Um, you've got them all in front of, you, front of you there. I don't know if there's any need to actually go through them, but um, no, you're quite happy to that. And is everybody OK to, to, to note that? Yep. 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 And I think that's our agenda.